I love Ferris wheels. I like them more than any other carnival ride. More than the roller coasters, more than the teacups, more than that super tall thing that drops you. And granted, part of this preference might come down to my sensitivity to motion sickness. But even if I could ride the Tilt-A-Whirl more than once without miserably hugging a trash can for the rest of the afternoon, I still think the Ferris wheel would be my favorite. It offers no thrills, no adrenaline rush. It doesn't have the competitive edge of the bumper cars or the photo op potential of the merry-go-round. But now that I think about it, it's the only carnival ride you can really enjoy from the ground, from outside the carnival entirely. It silhouettes elegantly against an empty sky. The languid stop and start of its rotation gives you time to fully appreciate the construction, the intricate crisscrossing of metal bars that allows this looming heavy structure to defy gravity. At night, it lights up the sky like a whirl of man-made stars, a human constellation. Ferris wheels are a recurring motif in Honey and Clover, a manga by Chika Umino originally published from 2000 to 2006 that was adapted into two seasons of an anime, two different live-action drama series, and a live-action film, but nonetheless seems to be largely forgotten by Western fandom. It's long been a favorite series of mine. I first encountered a few loose chapters of the manga in a middle school friend's borrowed copies of Shoujo Beat, and since then, it's drawn me in with its expressive art, its odd slice-of-life scenarios, and these internal monologues that drip with raw sincerity. As time's gone by, it's a series that I've returned to every few years. It's just one of those shows that envelops you in this warm, familiar feeling. And even when I don't walk away from repeat viewings with new insight on the show or the characters, I at least always have this sense that something's been reaffirmed in me, like being reminded of something that really matters. Specifically, as an artist with my own ambitions, I appreciate the outlook that Honey and Clover takes on what it means to be an artist, and even more broadly, what it means to chase your own happiness. As it returns again and again to the image of the Ferris wheel, Honey and Clover seems to ask, what drives human beings to create this towering but ephemeral beauty? Who is it for, and what makes it worthwhile? That's what I'm going to talk about in this video, Honey and Clover Retrospective, An Artist's Life. If you've never seen or read Honey and Clover, here's a brief summary. It follows a cast of five young adults as they navigate art school and post-graduation life, their budding careers, and their unrequited romantic longings. And there's a lot of unrequited love in this show. I can pretty much sum up the entire cast in two love triangles. The first has Yuta Takemoto, our meek but determined protagonist, and Shinobu Morita, an eccentric upperclassman. They're both vying for the heart of Hagu Hanamoto, a socially anxious, artistic genius. In the other, we have Ayu Yamada, an independent but innocent pottery major. She is desperately in love with Takumi Mayama, the oldest and generally most mature member of the group, who rejects Ayu's advances while pining after Rika, the woman he works for. These love triangles sum up the bulk of the character relationships for the entire show. Truth be told, it's a simple series where not much happens, even though it takes place over the course of about four years. There's a good chance that any romantic fixation that exists in the first episode will stick around until the end. With all this time spent on the cast's love triangles, you might wonder how their art comes into play. Well, when we break down these characters, you can see Chika Umino creating two broad contrasting archetypes, two different types of artists, both present in her cast. This brings us to part one, motives. Let's take a look at Takemoto, our protagonist. At the start of the story, Takemoto is still a first year student. He's meek, a little bit of a pushover, and on the surface, he can feel like a pretty mild character. He has no grand ambitions when it comes to his art career. By his own admission, he chose art school simply because he likes to work with his hands. Thus, a pretty big chunk of the show is spent on Takemoto's uncertainty as an artist. What does he want to do with his life? What is he passionate about? What is he meant to create? Takemoto isn't motivated by some grand artistic vision, but we get to see plenty of his true motivations. We learn that Takemoto comes from a single-parent household, his father having died when he was still very young. It seems like he cared for his mother as he grew older, but now she has a new husband in the picture, and he's off at college, and he's transitioning into a life where he has to think of himself and his own wants. Takemoto falls in love at first sight with Hagu, and throughout the show, he shows a strong desire to be by her side and to take care of her. If I had to sum up Takemoto as a character, I'd say that he's compassionate and he's attentive toward others, but still too naive to be especially insightful. He's just an earnest, thoughtful guy. Takemoto studies architecture. While we don't see much of the work he creates, we do get to see his graduation project. 
He builds this looming, precarious looking tower. It's really cool, but it exemplifies his lack of direction. It's as though he didn't know what to build or what dimensions to give it, so he just kept letting this structure grow taller, caught endlessly in the meditative act of building. But I love the parts of the show where we get to see buildings and other structures through Takemoto's eyes. There's this arc where he goes on a long bike tour. He just sets out one day and starts riding and keeps going just to see how far he can get. It's basically that metaphor of his giant tower made literal. He comments on the different houses that he sees along the way and comments on how people tend to resemble the houses they live in. He wonders what kind of house he would be. And there's this other scene where he walks across this bridge with giant gaps between each slot of wood, big enough for a person to fall through, and it becomes an observation about how even something completely easy, like walking across these thick, evenly placed slats of wood, seems terrifying when you know the consequences of a mistake being disaster. I'm going off on a tangent, but this is the kind of thing I really love about Honey and Clover. Takemoto isn't some genius artist with an incredible, unique vision, but his relationship with his craft is earnest and profound. He looks at the everyday structures that surround people, and he has a sense for the relationships people have with their environments. But in the end, it's the people that matter to him. He's not beholden simply to the act of building or of creating great things. At the end of the show, Takemoto decides to work for these traveling temple restorers he met on his trip. He likes the work that they do, but more than that, he just likes being a part of their team. It's simple, and it's practical, and it's fulfilling to him in a really personal way. That was a lot of words about best boy Yuta Takemoto, but I also want to talk about Ayu and Mayama. I'll keep this section more brief. Ayu and Mayama are a lot like Takemoto. Their art is important to them, but their artistic visions aren't a primary concern. Ayu clearly loves pottery, and she's exceptionally skilled at what she does. Throughout the show, we watch her turn to the pottery wheel when she's plagued with questions or anxieties. As she slowly molds pieces of clay into solid, smooth, tangible shapes, we can imagine her sorting through her own complicated feelings. Her craft winds up getting her job opportunities and even connecting her to Nomiya, her second love interest. We also have Mayama, who winds up working for a couple different design studios after graduating. Other characters comment that he's diligent, attentive to details, and very talented at what he does, and it's part of why they value him so highly. For Mayama and Ayu, their crafts are crucial parts of their lives, but equally or more important are the ways their artistic skills connect them to the people around them, their work communities, and their respective love interests. In Honey and Clover, Chika Umino writes with an eye toward everyday working artists. For a show about art school students, you might expect them all to have these grand visions in mind, ideas about what they want to express, lofty goals, and desires for recognition. But Takemoto, Ayu, and Mayama all work on the more practical end of the spectrum, and I really admire that Umino can give them a sincere and personal relationship with their crafts, even though their goals are more humble. So that's the first artist archetype that we get from Honey and Clover. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Hagu and Morita. Let's talk about Hagu. At the start of the show, Hagu is a first-year student, living and studying with her cousin, Shuji Takemoto, a professor and friend to the rest of the cast. Hagu grew up in the countryside with her grandmother. She's shy and suffers from severe social anxiety, and she's not very good at expressing herself. But she loves art. She loves it. When she was a kid, she used to paint the same landscape visible from her home over and over and over. Part of the reason Hanamoto took her away from the countryside was so she could experience more of the world and reproduce it in her art. That's something the other characters always talk about, Hagu's art being a representation of the unique way she sees the world. She's treated as a profound genius, someone who naturally creates masterpieces. For the other characters in the cast, art is a bridge that connects them to the people around them, but it's not like that for Hagu. If anything, her art is maybe one window into her mind, or maybe it's a tiny life preserver, in a world that leaves her feeling alienated where she struggles to express herself and to connect fully with others, her paintings and sculptures are abstract manifestations of her thoughts. Now, Hagu is a painfully sweet, caring girl. There's a scene I love where Takimoto is feeling down and she starts suggesting all this delicious food they could go eat, lacking the words to comfort him but desperate to cheer him up. In one of the most iconic scenes of the show, she spends an entire evening searching for a four-leaf clover to give to Hanamoto before he leaves on a trip, again desperate to wish him well and seeing no other way to do so. Hagu's behavior can be really sweet, but her social anxiety isn't something cloying or cute. It's clear that she really struggles with her inability to naturally connect with others. She needs her art just as innately as others need to speak. In some regards, it's really all she has. 
The contrast between artists like Takemoto and artists like Hagu is made pretty explicit throughout the show. Takemoto struggles to find his passion and get a job. Hagu struggles with the overwhelming question of what her life would even mean to her if she can't create what she wants. In one heartbreaking scene toward the end of season one, Takemoto walks into Hagu's studio and finds her weeping in anguish on the floor. He loves her, and he wants desperately to reach out to her. But Takemoto, knowing he has nothing to say that wouldn't feel like an empty platitude, makes the excruciating decision to leave her alone. But despite all I've said, Hagu isn't the only isolated cast member defined by her art. There's one other character with a similar relationship toward creating, and together, he and Hagu tell a tragic story. This leads us to part two, The Cost of Genius. You would not expect Shinobu Morita to become one of the show's tragic characters. In the beginning, he's basically the designated comic relief guy. A huge chunk of episode one is dedicated to this genuinely really funny scene where Takemoto tries to wake him up for class so he doesn't have to repeat a year for the fourth time. Countless gags throughout the show are dedicated to Morita being cheap, talented in the strangest ways, and willing to do anything for a quick buck. You also wouldn't expect him to wind up having such a complex relationship with Hagu. At the start of the show, he torments the girl, using her in some of his most thoughtless money-making schemes. But everything about Morita, even the silliest stuff, warrants being unpacked, especially as the show continues and he's shown to have so much going on below the surface. Like, okay, Morita is cheap. No one can dispute that, but after a while, you start to realize that he doesn't seem to be using any of his hefty wads of cash on himself. The guy wears flip-flops everywhere. And it's not like he never spends it on anything. We see him buy expensive gifts for Hagu and buy food for his friends. Not good food, mind you, but it's a thoughtful gesture. On top of all that, he seems to be willing to drop anything when his brother Kaoru comes to him with a high-paying job. There's clearly something he needs the money for, some goal that he's willing to sacrifice grades and relationships for without a second thought. Toward the end of the story, we finally learn what that goal is. To make a long story short, Kaoru and Shinobu's father, an inventive and creative but not very business-minded man, was betrayed by his brother, screwed over by a big company, and basically lost everything he had. So his sons have been saving up money for years to buy out the very same company and finally get revenge on behalf of their late father. Once we learn this, we can start to piece together a fuller image of what it means to be Shinobu Morita. First, let's be clear. Morita is a genuinely compassionate person. Morita and Ayu have one of the most compelling friendship dynamics in the show because it shows off that side of him. He asks Ayu multiple times why she's so hung up on Mayama, why she keeps letting him break her heart. He doesn't ask it judgmentally, he really doesn't get it, and he clearly doesn't like to see her hurting. In scenes like this, we witness Morita's approach to compassion. He's concerned about Ayu while she cries, so he gives her a bottle of water and tells her not to dehydrate. He offers to take Hagu on a shopping trip for art supplies, and can't accommodate in the slightest for her social anxiety, leaving her quietly distressed. He wants to stay by his brother's side and support him, so he agrees to participate in this bereft quest for revenge. At least in this last case, we know he can tell that Kaoru is behaving self-destructively, but he seems incapable of changing things for the better. Yes, Morita cares for the people around him, but he has little sense for how to give them what they need. And you can't really blame him because, so often, the people he loves have already stalemated themselves in hopeless cycles of bitterness and desperation. It really casts Morita's obsession with money in a different light. You want to laugh at this giant sculpture he made of himself holding giant wads of cash, and you do, but in retrospect, is this his true measure of happiness and satisfaction? Can he grasp value through metrics other than materialism? Or if he does, how often does he let himself admit what's missing? An opportune moment to mention that Morita spends eight years in college and then re-enrolls. Again, it's played off as a joke, but that's how afraid he is of leaving this community behind. Hagu and Morita are, without a doubt, the two most talented artists in the main cast of Honey and Clover. Hagu is said to have the kind of talent that could leave a lasting mark on art history. Morita literally wins an Academy Award. But their talents, driven by their unique ways of seeing the world, are also what alienate them from others. Hagu works alone on huge, inscrutable works of art that represent an inner world she can't hope to express otherwise. 
Morita's artistic ambitions drive him across oceans, separate him from the friends and family who he so clearly needs by his side. In the worldview of Honey and Clover, this is the potential cost of singular talent, a singular, lonely existence in the world. So far, this video has been a pretty straightforward analysis of the characters of Honey and Clover, but this is a retrospective, so let's take a moment to consider retrospect. Let's talk about Sangatsu no Lion. Sangatsu no Lion, also called March Comes In Like a Lion, is Chika Umino's follow-up to Honey and Clover, and the manga is still running today. It's about Rei Kiriyama, an orphaned high schooler who lives alone and supports himself as a professional shogi player. The series follows his growth and his expanding relationships, especially with the Kawamoto sisters, a family of three girls who welcome Rei into their home and become quite close with him. Rei is a young prodigy, repeatedly told that he's potentially on track to going down in history, to someday being perhaps the greatest living shogi player. In the world of shogi, he's a really big deal. But Sangatsu is the type of show that shifts perspectives. It will spend story arcs focused on other characters, treating their conflicts as equally significant to Rei's. Like, for example, there's a major arc about Hina, a middle school student dealing with bullying at school. There's a storyline about one of Rei's mentors, Shimada, trying to get far enough in a tournament just to play a match in his rural hometown. There's a story about Rei's adoptive mother, a simple housewife, where she reflects on her relationship with her children. There are stories about the sweets shop the Kawamoto family runs, about studying for entrance exams, and countless scenes about food. And as for Rei, we don't really see him grappling with grand ambitions so much as a series of smaller, more intimate goals. So why am I talking about all this? Well, aside from the fact that Sangatsu is one of my favorite shows of all time and I'll take any excuse to talk about it at length, I think it really clearly develops the fundamental ethos of Chika Umino's work. As far as I know, no one ever states their life philosophy outright, but you can feel an overarching message woven through the series. No matter who you are, no matter the scale of your dreams or your talent, no matter how modest your ambitions, Everyone's lives have weight and purpose. We can all find fulfillment if we connect authentically with our communities, carve out a comfortable place for ourselves in this world, and treat every day as an opportunity to grow. Maybe it loses some power when I put it into words, but it's an earnest message that I feel so strongly in Sangatsu no Lion. There are so many characters in this series living totally average existences, but even simple moments in their lives can feel so important. And now, over a decade after its resolution, this is the message I reflect on when I look back at Honey and Clover. Honey and Clover is a messier, less eloquent story. The plot meanders, the character development can feel uneven, relationships can sometimes take on a telling, not showing kind of vibe. The end of the story has a twist that's so baffling, but also so obvious and real, I can't help but earnestly love it. And that can all be part of the charm. In a way, Honey and Clover really captures the slow aimlessness of your early 20s. But looking back at the show in the context of Umino's later work, I can't help but focus more than ever on moments of warmth and connection. While nothing in the work feels autobiographical by any means, I can still sense within it an artist with a deep love for her craft, but an even richer love for people. And that's how I view the characters. They're a tangled web of young adults all chasing after a feeling of warmth and belonging. It's where they find that warmth that differs. Part 3. What we talk about when we talk about loving art. Earlier, I mentioned some scenes where Takemoto talks about architecture and other structures in our environment, observing how they influence and reflect our lives. I've buried the lead a little bit, but there's one other instance of that that I want to talk about. In episode 10, the group of friends encounters a ferris wheel and they decide to go for a ride. Once they're in the air, Takemoto reflects on the experience. He admits that he never liked ferris wheels growing up, preferring exciting rides like roller coasters. But now, he's come to an understanding. Sitting across from Hagu and Morita, the appeal starts to dawn on him. Ferris wheels are there for people to slowly cross the sky with someone they love. In a story full of artwork and architecture, it matters that Ferris wheels are a symbol the anime calls back to again and again. Thematically, they capture so much. 
A Ferris wheel straddles an already very hazy line between art and what you might call design. As a work of environmental design, it's created with safety, durability, and practicality in mind. Loads of consideration goes into everything from the exact angles the metal bars need to be welded at to properly balance the structure, to cushions on the seats that ensure the best possible experience for the rider. But Ferris wheels also have a sort of superfluousness we sometimes ascribe to art. It doesn't strictly need to exist. It's not serving an immediate practical purpose. It's purposeful unto itself, a spectacle, there to be enjoyed. And although our mental image of a Ferris wheel may be pretty consistent, there's actually a fair amount of expressive variation that goes into the aesthetic experience. It matters that a Ferris wheel captures different forms of artistic beauty, a bold spectacle that's also practical and elegant. Chika Umino is careful to never recognize one form of art as more valuable or legitimate than another. In a Ferris wheel, those distinctions seem to drift away altogether. It matters that a Ferris wheel gives you a change in perspective, as that's seen as the value in Haku's art. It's an experience that two people engage with equally, for just a moment sharing the same vision that brings them together. It matters that Ferris wheels are anonymous. Sure, there's a real team of people who put their skills and creativity into creating the ride, but it's unlikely that you'll ever know who they are. They don't get a little metal placard like a work in a museum. Whoever made the Ferris wheel didn't do it for glory or recognition. They did it because it's their job, or because they love design, or most likely, both. It matters that Ferris wheels are often ephemeral. There aren't very many permanent Ferris wheels in the world, though a lot of them do seem to exist in Japan. Regardless, I think of them as something that moves from place to place, here one day, gone the next. Try as we might, even the most impactful art isn't meant to last forever. It will never give a creator immortality. Even the permanent Ferris wheels throughout the world will someday be gone. On that subject, Honey and Clover rarely touches on this notion of immortality. Characters barely seem interested in their legacy or even the audience of their work at all. There's a notable scene where Morita argues with Hanamoto that Hagu shouldn't be making art for competitions because she should be creating it from her own inspiration, that Hagu's work belongs in museums, and that it will only get there if she follows her desires and no one else's. But Hagu isn't doing it for recognition. Hagu is just trying to make a living. And Morita, despite being the most commercially successful of the bunch, doesn't seem much concerned with his own legacy either. Maybe the exclusion of this particular motive leaves Honey and Clover a bit incomplete as a work about artists finding themselves in their passions. A lot of creators crave lasting recognition, but I can also understand why Chika Umno wouldn't feel compelled to write about this. She's asking the question of what it takes for these artists to live happy and fulfilling lives. Fame never really factors into it here, and that, implicitly, says all you need to know about her perspective. What does motivate Hagu into creating for awards and competitions is the desire to live and support herself as an artist. All she wants to do is create, and she'll make anything for money that will subsidize her more personal work. But as the audience, we worry about her. She talks about the idea of moving home to the rural countryside, living alone where she can focus all of her energy on painting. But could that really be okay? Could someone really be happy sacrificing all of their personal relationships to pursue their passion? Unfortunately for her, the story forces Hagu to confront the extent of her devotion directly. Late in the second season, she winds up in an accident that badly injures her dominant hand. It puts her in the hospital, and she's told that she could only recover the full function of her hand through extensive physical therapy. There's even a chance that it wouldn't be enough. She may never recover. Hagu voices her judgment in a way that's immediate, but doesn't feel hasty. If I can't paint, she says, I'll die. She'll give her life back to God. The decision is that simple. This is Hagu's reality. Her life has no meaning without art. That doesn't stop the story from throwing her one last curveball, one final temptation that may fracture her resolve. Morita reappears after another disappearance, and he whisks Hagu away from the hospital to an apartment that was rented by himself and his brother. Morita, I might add, is also in a starry state at this point in the story. He's hit his own rock bottom, the moment where he too has to reconsider his commitments. He and his brother have finished their quest for revenge on the company that ruined their father, but this victory is not sweet. It's not even a relief. In fact, 
It seems to have left them both empty. Kaoru disappears, leaving his brother to wonder what all of that hard work has been for. He expresses that his talent, the thing that's led to all of his success, has also made people use and discard him or avoid him altogether. So when he brings Hagu here, Morita is ready to put words to the alternative, another way they can live. It's a simple plea. Give up art and live with me. Give up this pain and the struggle against your own body. We can leave it all behind and find a way to be happy together. The night falls on their excursion, Morita having finally pleaded his case. In the morning, Hagu wakes up in a state of terror. She can't feel her hand again. She starts right back on her state of absolute fear and dread. She says it again. If I can't paint, I'll die. Morita, at last, resigns himself to the truth. Hagu has already made her decision. Above love, above a peaceful life, she's already chosen art. Ayu says that she would choose love above anything else. Morita and Takemoto would both be willing to risk it all if they thought that they could make Hagu happy. Rika chases after the memory of her late husband, while Mayama chases after her. And Hanamoto's happy ending only comes when he can promise his entire life to Hagu. Hagu is the only character willing to give up everything, including love, just to continue painting. But even so, we can understand that she wouldn't have been truly happy living in the countryside and painting all alone. Hagu didn't know how to ask for more, possibly had never considered that she could have more than that. Drawing and painting were her escape for so long, she had never considered other people part of the equation of her happiness. But Hanamoto gives her something different. He knows how to answer to her social anxiety, and he makes it easier for her to live in the world. And in her own words, Yes, Shuji is definitely my reign. When he's there, I can breathe in deep. And I can grow and grow the way trees and grass do. Nurtured by that kind and sweet smile. Growth. This is one other piece of the equation, and one that Honey and Clover doesn't always highlight. I've mentioned that the show's plot can really meander. Characters like Ayu and Mayama can feel trapped in a state of arrested development more than anything else. But toward the end, the sense of growth is certainly there. I feel it the most in this scene with Takemoto and Morita. Morita was just rejected by Hagu, and now both of them are fully accepting that they've lost the fight for her heart. They could commiserate together, but instead they start fighting. Like, literally throwing each other around, fighting. And it's so far from where they started. Takemoto once meek and somewhat intimidated by Morita, but still very forgiving. Morita, who once carelessly tormented Takemoto and never seemed to express much more than that. Over the course of the show, and in response to everything they've been through, these two have completely changed. And you could be sad that these friends are having such a huge falling out, but I find this scene so satisfying. Not only has Takemoto grown enough to finally stand up to Morita, but both of them can give voice to their complicated feelings and express them in words. At the end of the show, Takemoto expresses that the time he spent loving Hagu will live on in his heart forever. But that lasting change isn't just about bittersweet nostalgia. It's about a love that's driven him to this frustrated desperation that finally surfaced a rift between two possibly incompatible friends. Takemoto has been frustrated with Morita for a long time, after all. The act of loving Hagu has forced him to grow in so many difficult, necessary ways. And I think that kind of growth has, ironically, made him a happier person. Hagu, too, has grown. She's more confident, less afraid of others. She's developed deep feelings for her friends that surround her and newly channels that passion into her work. Hagu may not be able to live without painting. But as the audience, we feel proudest of her in moments like this, when we see how she's learned to love. Conclusions I make this video partially because I'm an artist too. Like the cast of Honey and Clover, I studied art in college, and now I work on my comics almost every single day. It's hard work, and it's a process I've really had to reevaluate my feelings about over and over and over. As artists, I think we can fetishize our own will to create, 
We can stake too much on the idea that art gives meaning to our lives. There's this manga that I absolutely love. It was localized as Blank Canvas by Akiko Higashimura. It's autobiographical about her art education and journey to becoming a manga artist. And there's this line toward the end that's stuck with me for years. I'll keep on drawing, she says, because drawing is all I can do. It's what I was born to do, after all. It's what all of us artists were born to do. Whether we're good or not, we have to keep drawing. Every waking moment until the day we die. I choose to read this line with a small sense of, I don't know, irony, self-awareness. It's clearly not a totally healthy line of thinking, but it's such a romantic concept. I can't help but feel drawn to it. There have been so many times over the years that I've revisited this line and it's urged me to keep going. But is it true? Is drawing really all I can do, even if I am pretty bad at it? Well, no, I don't think so. There are a lot of creative outlets out there. There are so many hobbies and pursuits that could give my life the general sense of purpose that I get from art now. Maybe blank canvas is the story I go back to when I feel unmotivated, when I want the inspiration to get back to that long, exhausting, and honestly satisfying task of working hard. But Honey and Clover is what I return to when that's not what I need. Those times when I've retreated too far into myself, when I stake too much on the work I create, and whether it's any good and whether it will ever reach someone the way I want it to, there are times when I need to be reminded that art is only one part of life, and anyway, art should be able to connect you with other people, so why don't you go do an art swap or role play some anime with your friends or something embarrassing like that? Maybe there are artists like Hagu in the world, people who really couldn't keep living without their ability to create. But even Hagu wouldn't have gotten her happy ending if we'd continued to watch her physical therapy until her hand was healed. Her bittersweet happy ending comes from her standing in a place of love and connection and belonging and growth. There's one other thing about Ferris wheels. Even if the wheel keeps spinning on and on endlessly, your ride only lasts so long. And rather than retreating into yourself or torturing yourself, you'll want to spend that time crossing the sky with someone you love.